page 503 continued. Longinus, L-O-N-G-I-N-U-S, comma, quote, the first romantic critic, unquote, para. In 1554, Robotello, the Italian critic, first presented a treatise written in Greek with the title On the Sublime. Its authorship was ascribed to a rhetorician named Dionysius Longinus. Some critics point out that the work belonged to that Longinus who was the famous minister of Queen Zenobia of Palmyra. The controversy still goes on and who its author actually was still remains uncertain. Therefore, the traditional authorship is retained and the work is assigned to one Quote, Longinus, L-O-N-G-I-N-U-S, unquote, stop. On the sublime seems to have been written in the latter half of the first century AD. It is assumed that it was written to correct the fault of an essay on the same subject by Cecilus, C-A-E-C-I-L-U-S, who belonged to the first century AD, para. On the sublime, a critical document of great worth and significance is the most precious legacy of the Greco-Roman period. It has come down to us in an imperfect form as one third of the original document is missing. We have only a part of the actual work which is sufficient to express clearly the author's intention. Page 504 it has been influenced by Plato as revived and interpreted by Neoplatonists and Aristotle. Scott James remarks that Longinus, comma, quote, superimposed the imagination and insight of Plato, unquote, on, quote, the Aristotelian method, unquote, stop. He was a rhetorician who was well versed with grammar and composition analytical criticism, rules of art, the proper use of words, meter and figures of speech, para. As a critic and theorizer, Longinus has a comprehensive vision. Abercrombie calls him the first comparative critic of literature. Scott James hails him as, quote, the first romantic critic, unquote, stop. He was the first to expound the doctrines upon which Romanticism rests. He is the first Romantic critic due to his insistence on passion, sublimity, ecstasy, transport, imagination and exaltation. Professor Atkins admires him as a great classical critic. Though Longinus was the first critic to expound the doctrines upon which Romanticism rests, he tempered them with what it to what is sanest in classicism. He is thus a balanced critic who evolved a sim synthesis between Romanticism and classicism, Plato and Aristotle. Para. On the sublime and analysis. Longinus addresses his friend, Terentian, T-E-R-E-N-T-I-A-N, tells him of his purpose, which was so correct, which was to correct the fault of Sicilius' essay on the sublime and make some other preliminary, it should be preliminary observations. Para. <coughs> what is sublimity? <coughs> To instruct, to delight, and to persuade had been the aim of poets, writers, and orators. Longinus was not satisfied with it. He concluded that the epics of Homer, the lyrics of Sappho, and Pindar, the tragedies of Aeschylus and Sophocles, and the orations of Demosthenes had all these qualities, but they were conspicuous for their sublimity. It is a certain loftiness and excellence in language. 
it does not merely persuade, it carries us away almost irresistibly. It expresses itself in the general structure of a work. Sometimes it may express itself in a single phrase like a flash of lightning. It is only through sublimity that the greatest poets and prose writers have derived eminence and gained immortality. According to Longinus, sublimity or loftiness in literature implies ecstasy hyphen transport dash quote lifting out of oneself unquote stop. He writes Cologne quote the sublime consists in a certain loftiness and consumedness of language, comma, and it is by this and this only that the greatest poets and prose writers have won preeminence and lasting fame, unquote, stop. He adds, Cologne, quote, for a work of genius does not aim at persuasion, karma, but ecstasy or lifting the reader out of himself, <coughs> dot, dot, dot. But the sublime at the critical moment shoots forth and tears the whole thing to pieces like a thunderbolt, comma, and in a flash reveals the author's power." Unquote, stop. According to Longinus, the sublime effect of literature is attained by revelation or illumination and not by persuasion. Its appeal is not through the reason but through the imagination. Scott James observes, quote, its effect upon the mind is immediate, comma, like a flash of lightning upon the mind, unquote, stop. What are the sources of the sublime? There are five principal sources of the sublime. One, grandeur of thought. Two, strong and inspired passion and the vigorous treatment of it. Three, the use of figures. A, figures of thought. B, figures of language or expression. 4. Noble diction, including a proper choice and arrangement of words and handling of metaphor and other ornaments of diction. 5. Dignified, elevated and elaborate composition. Para. The first two of these sources are inborn gifts of a genius. The others can be acquired by art. Longinus recognizes that, quote, thought and language in literature are for the most part interfolded each in the other, unquote, stop. Among the sources of sublimity, Longinus puts first grandeur of thought and vigorous spirited treatment of passions. He says, Cologne, quote, for beautiful words are the true and peculiar light of the mind, unquote, stop. Para, Longinus distinguishes between the quote, true sublime, unquote, and the quote, false sublime, unquote. The false sublime is characterized by bombastic language and puerile, tawdry, affected and frigid expressions. The false sublime results when there is a cheap display of passion, when it is not justified by occasion and so is wearisome. The literature of Longinus' age was falsely sublime. Quote, All these ugly and parasitical growths, unquote, karma, he says, quote, in literature arise from a single cause, karma, that pursuit of novelty in the expression of ideas, which may be regarded as the fashionable craze of the day, unquote, stop. The true sublime, quote, consists in a certain distinction and elevation of expression, unquote, stop. It, quote, pleases all and pleases always, unquote, stop. Para, Longinus plays as a critic. As a critic, Longinus was disinterested and free from prejudice. He displayed a rare breadth and catholicity of outlook. He was, quote, a classicist in taste, comma, a romanticist in temper, comma, and an idealist at heart, unquote, stop. His conception of sublimity 
partakes of these three elements. Page 505. Through it, he interprets a classicism anew to his age, directs the future romanticist, and gives a meaning and purpose to art by allaying it with what is noblest in human nature. He anticipated much that that is modern in critical work. His on the sublime remains towering and unsurpassable among all other works of its class. Para, the Roman classicists Horace and Quintilian. The Greek literary and critical tradition passed from Greece to Rome, which in 86 BC was flourishing in with literary and cultural activity. Known as the Augustan Age 31 BC to 14 AD, named after Bactavian Augustus, Bactavian, B E C T A V I A N, Augustus, A U G U S T U S, the first emperor of Rome. It was made glorious by the achievements of great writers. Virgil, Horace, Tibullus, Propitius, Ovid, Livoy, Horace, and Quintilian. Para. Horace, 65 BC to 8 BC, formulated his critical theory in Arts Poetica, known as the Art of Poetry. He followed the ancient classical line. He advised the would be writers to follow Greek models rigorously and faithfully. Be Homer's works your study and delight, comma. read them by day, comma, and meditate by night, stop, para. His Arts Poetica is a compendium of rules and principles which intending poets should follow. It deals with the art of poetry under three heads. A poesis or the subject matter, b. poema or form, and c. poeta or the poet. He also deals with the nature, function, subject matter, kinds, language, and relative importance of nature and art. Poetry, according to Horace, is a combination of fact and fiction, which both instructs and pleases the readers. Thus, the function of poetry is, quote, to instruct and to delight, unquote, stop. The nature of poetry is, quote, to charm the mind, unquote, stop. Horace says, quote, it is not enough for poems to have beauty. They must also be pleasing and lead the listener's soul, whether they will, unquote, stop. The theme of poetry should be, quote, simple and uniform, unquote, stop. A simple theme implies one from familiar matter or from life and customs, so which grace can be imparted by the power of order and connection or skill in craftsmanship. The poetic composition must have unity of design. Horace remarks, Cologne quote, he who chooses his subject wisely will find that neither words nor lucid arrangement fail him, unquote. For, quote, sound judgment is the basis and source of good writing, unquote, stop, para. Horace believes that poetry has subtle kinds which are distinguished by appropriate meter. His views on poetic language and diction are akin to those of Aristotle. He emphasizes the right choice of words and their effective arrangement in composition. Poetic language may, m must grow and develop with the growth of experience. A poet can use both familiar and a new word according to the theme. Familiar words, if skillfully used, acquire a great power. Horace says, Cologne quote, Your diction will be excellent if a clever combination renders a familiar word original, unquote, and quote, words newly coined will win credit if they descend from a Greek source, comma, slightly modified, unquote, stop. 
the poet must show quote taste and care in arranging words unquote stop order and connection are important in style para quintilian q u i n t i l i a n 35 ad to 95 ad was influenced by greek and roman classicists homer sophocles euripides pindar plato and aristotle among the greek classicists and virgil and horace among the romans in addition to classical influences he was also guided by his own experience reason and code the voice of nature unquote stop <clears throat> He writes on form alone and is silent on matter. His views are contained in D causes, D E C A U S I S comma corrupte C O R R U P T A E eloquential and institutio oratorio. Quintilian saw no logic in the distinction between the art of oratory and that of writing. According to him good style is the product of both nature and art the writing of prose is an art he disapproves quote spontaneous utterance unquote stop style consists of words and their proper arrangement well chosen words well chosen words if properly arranged communicate the writer's thoughts clearly and lucidly He is with Aristotle and Horace in believing that everyday subjects which prose treats of need familiar words for their most convincing expression. The language of prose is the language of daily life but it is not the language of the masses. It is a purged language purged of its eccentricities such as one finds in court the agrid practice of educated men unquote stop the words should be so nicely arranged that they produce first of all clarity and lucidity and then ornamental grace quote artistic structure unquote and rhythmical ease all ugly expressions as the use of undignified words in a dignified context of big words for small things grand words with commonplace poetic with prosaic old with new should be carefully avoided persuasion is essential for a good style other stylistic stylistic devices such as similes metaphors emphasis innuendo and other figures of speech should be used page 506 para quintilian quote standardized the vocabulary of formal criticism stop he sharpened the instruments with the student of co- composition should be equipped and quote stop he pioneered the comparative criticism quote he compares and quote comma writes scott james comma quote greek literature with roman comma the greek language with latin unquote stop dante 1265 to 1321 as a poet dante is remembered for his great epic divine comedy his famous critical treatise de vulgario eloquio known in english as of the vulgar tongue or of writing in the vernacular Dante's main concern was language as medium of expression and communication. During Dante's time, Latin was the main language. The learned could artistically use it. It was difficult for common men to attain excellence in it because it was a difficult classical language. There was no standard national language. It was a common belief in Dante's Italy as well in France and England. that no writing in the vernacular ever gained quote the dignity of manuscript comma nor did it reach the counters of bookshop unquote stop dante asserted the rights of native tongue both by precept and example for this very reason he wrote the divine comedy in the native language it attained the sublime heights of the iliad and the aeneid 
A E N A I D, para. None of the numerous dialects in Dante's Italy was worthy of being called the Italian language and worthy too of being the language of poetry. He enunciated the theory of the illustrious vernacular, the language of culture, which could be common to men of letters who meet together from all parts. It would be quote the tongue purged from provincialism, comma, employing words and turns of speech which are not peculiar to any one province or small state, comma, but are common to all, unquote, stop. Both as poet and critic, Dante was concerned with the thought of shaping and defining an ideal language fit to express the best thoughts of the greatest poets. His emphasis on the use of the vernacular does not mean, quote, the language of the common man, unquote, stop. He asserts, quote, avoid rustic language, comma, unquote. According to Dante, language is more important than the subject, but the importance of the subject cannot be ignored. He writes, quote, it is no use asking for a grand style until you have recognized that it can only be employed in the service of a grand theme, comma, as concerned by a man of great intellectual stature, unquote, stop. According to him, Best subjects are, quote, salus, S-A-L-U-S, that is safety, comma, vinas, V-E-N-U-S, that's love, and virtues, V-I-R-T-U-S, excellence. In other words, love of country, love of woman, and love of God, unquote, stop. The subjects belongs to three departments of human thoughts, moral, philosophy, and religion, para, Dante attaches importance to style, which consists of words and sentence structure. He classifies words into two categories, rustic and urban. The rustic words are ignoble and hence they would be excluded from the illustrious vernacular. He also excluded all Italian words which are childish, effeminate, slippery and rumpled. Dante included only urban words which are further classified as combed, C-O-M-B-E-D, that is pexa, P-E-X-A, and shaggy, S-H-A-G-G-Y, that is hirsuta, H-I-R-S-U-T-A. The former are words, quote, which leave the speaker's lips, comma, as it were with a certain sweetness, unquote. The shaggy words are ornamental, comma, which, quote, when mixed with combed words, make a beautifully harmonious conjunction, unquote, stop. Dante considers next the arrangement of words, which must be, quote, the most urbane in keeping with the urban vocabulary, stop. 